me, it looks like somebody is caring. That's right. Amen. And I thank God for that. That's right. Amen. That will be our theme for this year. Of course, my theme, I keep hearing Bethany say, don't let me down, Dad. Don't let me down. And so uh, I, I actually was not planning on being on the Emmaus board again, but because Bethany said, don't let me down, Dad, I'm going to be on the Emmaus board again. Amen. And so, and, and I will be giving you all information on that scholarship, the Emmaus scholarship. I've just got to get with the Emmaus board. Is this not on? Let's try it again. Are we on now? So I'm going to have to get together with uh, the Emmaus board so they can make sure they have it set up so when anybody donates to the Bethany Scholarship, because uh, uh, Bethany wanted so bad to send people to Emmaus. She was so excited about sending people to Emmaus, but every time we tried to go to one of those meetings where you get qualified to send somebody, she was always sick. Or she couldn't last, you know, couldn't last more like 30 minutes. Toward the end, she actually, by the time she got in the car, she was bushed. So it really, there just was no way. So we're going to keep it on though with her name. Amen. A living memorial. Okay. Ready for? Ready to rumble. <laughs> so stressed. We are so forced to rush, 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 rush. And I told Doug, I said, I have no peace. I said, I want to throw every single Christmas decoration away. I just want to throw everything in the house away. I'm just done because our house is upside down trying to get Christmas straight. And it's funny because when God wants my attention, he will give me a sign. So this morning when I got up, because I slept on the couch last night because I fell asleep, when I got up this morning, I went outside. That's my, my front porch, if you ever need to find me, is my favorite place to be. It was raining. But there was a peacefulness in the rain. And a peacefulness that came over me to let me know that everything was going to be okay. And he provided me the peace. And that's the difference between us as Christians and the world, is that people that know Christ and have been in the presence of the Lord experience peace even in the troubled times. So... My grandmother appeared to me this morning at my bird feeder in the form of a red cardinal. And that was the, the symbol of everything is going to be okay from God. Because I haven't had a cardinal in my year, in my in our yard the whole Christmas season. So I'm actually going to light the peace candle today. <laughs> and I hope that all of you as Christians have peace. Because God, his word said he was not sending the prince of chaos, the prince of hate and destruction. His word says he was sending the prince of peace to save the world. 
So with that said, I'm going to light the candle. And while I'm doing that, I would also like to thank D.C. for you always being prepared, D.C., and your praise and worship. And I know sometimes it's hard with everything that you have going on. The first time I ever heard the song, I Am a Friend of God, was at Glad Tidings Church in Moorhead City. And my friend Carrie Buck was the minister of music there. And I appreciate, D.C., your preparation for that. Because hands down, you sang it so much better than he did. <laughs> and that too. <laughs> I, I just appreciate that. So with that said, we're gonna, we've are gonna we already lit dug in D.C.'s candle of hope from last week. And today we're going to light the candle of peace. So I hope that if any of y'all are struggling with anything during the holiday season, that the world will see the peace on your face because they haven't seen it on my face at all this week. So anyway, now to you, Pastor David. <laughs> All right. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand to have a prayer. Amen. Always glad to be kind to pray with you somewhere. Just like high five, low five, low five. Blow a five to them. That's right. <laughs> Isn't God good? All the time. You know, uh, Santa Claus... Santa Claus was at the mall and was very surprised when a young lady about 20 years old walked up and sat on his lap. And Santa didn't use to take requests from adults, but she smiled very nice at him and she said, okay. He said to her, okay, you can ask something, but it has to be for someone other than yourself. What do you want for Christmas? She said, something for my mother. And Santa just smiled. He says, you really you want something for your mother? Well, that's very thoughtful of you. As he smiled again, he said, why do you want me to bring her? Without blinking, she said, a son in law. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, of course, I, it, it can be easy to, to just uh, have all these. Uh, the Lord been ministering to me, and, and just like this week, you know, I, the week after Beth died, and ever since, there's been something that I wound up ministering to, and all this week, uh, since, uh, matter of fact, since last weekend, all the way through this weekend, I've been going up to the heart center, but I have to go through the cancer center to the entrance to go. And the first time I went, I actually kind of just tried to stay away from the cancer center. And so the second time I went, I went walking through the cancer center. And I said, well, Lord, I, I know what you're trying to, I know, I, know what, I, know, I know what you're doing, not trying to do, what you're doing. Is, is you're telling me if you're going to be teaching the grieving cycle and you've gone through it enough, now you've got the greatest grieving cycle you've ever had, I need you to go ahead and jump in there and take the bull by the horns and let me heal you. And so as I was leaving the cancer center yesterday, again, I was thinking about this sermon and this message, and I went and said, Burger King and the Lord began to minister to me. So again, uh, I'm not going to ask you to forgive me for speaking on this. I'm just going to ask you to indulge me because I'm not the only one. Everybody in here uh, in the last year has suffered many, many, many hurts. Amen. We've all suffered losses. Amen. How many here have, have suffered a loss this year? Can, can you, can you uh, raise that hand? Because if you haven't suffered a loss personally, we lost. how many have we lost here in the church in the last year? How many in the last month? Okay? I mean, we, have, we lost Sister Kathleen. We lost... Uh, Sister Mary, we lost Bethany. We lost some more along the way. It's just it was just a constant thing. And so uh, again, like I said, it's, uh, and then uh, as I was, I remember Bethany when she first got in trouble. We had to wind up going to all these rehabs with her, and now we've been working with rehabs. And so I said, well, Lord, I'm telling you, if you're not trying to go ahead and, and get me to buckle down and, and and trust you, then I've never seen it. This is God, and I so, saw so instead of. Being, being concerned and asking God why, I'm asking God, what do you want me to learn? And so this is part of what this is. Because I left, actually, uh, I left the cancer center just before I was handling rehab. And so I stopped at Burger, not Burger King, but at uh, uh, Starbucks. My mind's still, still numb, but it's always been a little numb, amen? 
<laughs> I was going to say that for somebody said it for me. Amen. Get your Bible out. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now I've used this before on several occasions. I use it at funerals, but this is going to be a little different. Uh, again, this is fresh off, fresh off the press and fresh off uh, the hits of Sister Kathleen and Sister Mary and Bethany. It's, it's kind of wild how we went from the oldest to one of the youngest, you know, all in this. But hopefully today, and it's only part one today, so next week will be part two, and then we're going to have our Christmas uh, gala on the, 20, on the Sunday before Christmas, and I think it's awesome, absolutely awesome. It's always, you know, it, 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 it does good for us sometimes to break out of the rut. Amen. Y'all know what a rut is? Yes. A rut is a grave with both ends kicked out of it. Amen. So it's good to get out of the rut. So so that's it. we're getting out of the rut. Every we return, we're getting out of ruts. Amen. So, so today I want to talk to you about when your broken heart overshadows your joyful heart. I heard you talking about when you were talking up here. You know, uh, yesterday I'm walking through uh, uh, Walmart or somewhere, and I looked and I said, you know what? I bet Bethany would like that for Christmas. And I started to pick it up and put it in my cart. And then it hit me. She's not here. And I said, and if she could speak, she wouldn't want to leave Walmart. <laughs> Not after experiencing what she's experienced. Amen. Yeah. And yeah, Walmart would be kind of substandard compared to what she's getting right now. Amen. So stand for the reading of the word. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 15. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 15. And Nathan departed into his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For well, they said, Behold, while the child yet lived, we spake unto him, and he would have not hearkened to our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and and when he had required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then, then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou did fast and weep for the child while it was alive. When the child was dead, thou did raise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Shall I go to him? Or I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. And we'll review that a little next week. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. You're alive and well on the throne, Father. And I thank you, God, that not only you're alive and well on the throne, but we know God and Sister Kathleen and Sister Mary and Bethany are all around there with you. And they're enjoying a new Christmas uh, actually seeing the Christ child, not by eyes of faith, but they actually see Jesus Christ in all his glory. What a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. What a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we give this day to you, and we know that you have got this. In the name of Jesus, we pray in the church said, Amen. Amen. You'll be sitting away down and give somebody a high five and tell them it's so good to be in God's house today, in spite of 12 inches of snow out in the yard. When I got this morning at 6 o'clock, uh, we had a little over an inch in my house, and actually I didn't go out and measure it, but I did when I went to go get off my car. Probably had more like an inch and a half on the car, but it was so easy to get off the car. I took a broom and just swept it right off, so it was not like, I said, okay, it'll be fine. And then I found out that it wasn't as bad. The closer you got this way, the better it was. So I said, all right. You know, so I came and said, whoever shows up, we're going to have church. Whoever doesn't show up, well, okay. Okay, so here we go. You know the Lord? Amen. Amen. 
See, uh, uh, Christmas is a season of joy. Amen? Amen. But not for some. Got to stop right there for a minute. You said it. What you said was so honest and heartfelt and actually was on the pulse of a lot of people. They won't say it. They won't admit it. You did, sister. I, I, I honestly, I, I am... Happen, okay? Because actually, I didn't feel like doing Christmas either. I, I, I'd walk in the store and hear something. Uh, I'd hear Bethany telling me, come on, Dad, look over here at this. I know she's not there. I just kept hearing it. I kept hearing a witch hill or a whistle around her neck. Her mother and I both keep hearing that whistle go off. You know, uh, uh, like I said, I saw her walking in the house. Just all this stuff, you know. And, and, and I'll get in the store and have to go by. I, I went to the first time I went to the hospital. I was at the hospital, and people met me at the doors from the cancer center and said, we're so sorry about your daughter. And I said, I'm sorry that she's not here, but I'm praising God for where she's at. And we talked a little bit, and then, and then I went to the heart center. And when I come back, I thought, and I looked in there, and the guy was in there, and he had the Christmas tree beside him with IVs like Bethany had, and, and he couldn't talk at the time. He had talked with his eyes, and that's the same thing Bethany was doing. And I said, okay, God, we got this. You and me together got this. It's got to be me and you and mostly you. And everything was fine. Everything was fine until I left the store. And Bethany always, when she felt like it, the last month or so, she just said, Dad, can we go home? And I, I, mean, I just go home, take her ride home. Well, she wanted to stop by Five Below, or she wanted to stop by Aldi's. And so I stopped by Aldi's. And as soon as I walked in Aldi's, I walked right into the wheelchair that I pushed her around in Aldi's with that shopping cart on. And I lost it. And so I walked over to the made for TV or made or sold on TV or whatever you call it. Over there where nobody was at. And I just sat there and me and the Lord had a little talk and and, and a little comforting session. And then, I, then as soon as I walked, just as soon as I walked out, somebody saw me from another end of the store and said, Hey brother Lynn, can we talk? I said, I'm praising God that you got was over there before they want to talk. And so again, grieving is not is not easy. Grieving is something that everybody's going to do, whether you like it or not. Everybody's going to grieve, and everybody grieves differently. So this, this is what this is about. Now, again, Christmas is that season of joy. But, you know, uh, uh, as things happen in our life and as things go on in our life, we'll find out that sometimes things that used to bring us joy doesn't seem to bring us quite as much joy as it did before. And sometimes, just sometimes, the problem is that we are grieving and we're stuck. Let it sink in. We're stuck. We're stuck in a grieving cycle. We're stuck in certain certain aspects of a grieving cycle. Thinking about things that happened before and thinking about what happened on certain days and all this. And as you're thinking about all this stuff, then all of a sudden, uh, uh, without even realizing that you're in a grieving cycle, you don't understand why what used to bring you joy does not bring you joy anymore, just like Christmas. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, but, but here we go. Watch this. Let's, let's, let's just take this a little deeper. Well, we've all experienced loss this season, or this season. Or, or like I said, we got Sister Kathleen, Sister Mary, Bethany, and there's other people that have died in the community and died in our family. My Uncle Ralph died just a few weeks before Bethany died. And Uncle Ralph, the last thing Uncle Ralph said to Bethany was, girl, we've got an advantage over the rest of these people because we're going to see Jesus before anybody else does. And I remember, listen, he told the truth. They've already seen Jesus. And so all this stuff going on, my daddy, actually his brother younger than him died, died, and of course his funeral was because it cremated him. His memorial service was because of the hurricane. It got moved aside. So his brother goes to his brother's funeral uh, and, and up towards Greensboro on one Sunday. And then the following Sunday, he comes to Chalk Wendy and has his other brother, his older brother, other's funeral. So he had two brothers die just about virtually at the same time. And so there's all this stuff that goes on with people. And, and, and the world says, we give you three days to grieve, and then that's it. You got three days. Matter of fact, you know, while it's going on, you got all these people around you and supporting you, and, 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 it, and it, it, it hurts, but it helps. But then after those, after that week or so, or maybe after that month, on for the next six months to a year, you actually have a lot of times to do a lot of grieving just on your own, just you and God. 
The average man, a grieving cycle lasts from six months to a year and a half. The average woman, the average grieving cycle lasts from a year and a half to three years. And that's what, and to get through a grieving cycle does not mean that you no longer remember. It just means to remember with less pain. That's it. Remember with less pain. Some days there's times where I feel like my mama just died yesterday. Sometimes I feel like Beverly just died yesterday. And of course, you know, Bethany, bless her heart, we joke so much. Uh, uh, bless her heart. I, I, I find myself doing more joking about me and Beth than I've ever done before because that's all we did. We just joked all the time. So, so look, you may have been hurt by circumstances and losses. And so because of that, it's overshadowed or crowded out your joy. We look at the manger, which is life, and all we see is a coffin, death. Now, don't raise your hand. You ain't got to. But how many of you here, when you think about that manger, not necessarily the manger itself, but that season, that's going to be so full of life, all you can think about is death. All you can think about is bad. All you can think about is things that hurt. And so because of that, you know, it was just a, just a few days ago when I actually started doing some more Christmas shopping because I had it hard to do because I had Bethany. Bethany was just constant. She just required constant attention. And so I couldn't take her to the store. And so I get some stuff. Normally I shop all year, but this whole year has been Bethany. And so I started a couple, well, actually just a few days ago, I started really getting serious uh, about Christmas again because, again, when, I'll be honest with you. I love God, I, I trust Him with all my heart, and I know when I say this, some might misconstrue what I'm saying, what I'm trying to tell you, or misunderstand. When I look at the manger, life, and I'm not talking about Jesus, I'm talking about the season. All I see at times is a coffin. Okay, and the reason why is because on December 16th, 1997, my mama died. Buried on the 20th. 2001, Beverly died on December 20th. Buried on the 23rd. And now Bethany dies the Saturday before Thanksgiving. She's buried the Saturday after Thanksgiving. But everywhere I go, I see Bethany. And so again, watch this. We all have these times, these seasons of loss. It's not just a one-time thing. People try to think, you know, but well, they've had it three days. They've stayed out of work for three days. They ought to come back and be ready. And you're not thinking, no, no, because I sit back down and I watch and I, I hear my, I feel my brain numb. I remember after, after Beverly died and, and we had a, a major auto, a worldwide auto that found me. And it was right after Beverly died. The auditors came in. One of the auditors was the man that checked the O-ring on the challenger. Okay, he was the guy that found out, they, they checked the other rings on the new ones and found out what had happened to the Challenger, uh, all that stuff, the explosions and all that stuff. So he was one of the guys, and the other lady that came actually wrote the book. So they come in to do us, and it's the worst audit fountain ever had. I mean, we flunked it so bad, I thought I was going to be fired before the end of the day. And the COO came to me and said, put his arm around me and said, I know this is not good. I said, this is bad. This is the worst we've ever had. He said, but he put his arm around me. I thought he was going to say, so we'll see you some other time. But instead he put his arm around me and said, you know what? He said, I want to apologize. And I said, apologize for what? He said, we let you down. He said, we know how bad you're hurting and we threw all this on you. And I said, we're so sorry. And I remember the day I was walking up the engineering, I was walking up the steps. And as I'm walking up the steps, all of a sudden that numbness went away, my brain came back. And I felt it hit so hard, it was amazing. I never had that feeling before. I had that feeling I could think again. And I ran upstairs and I started looking at my computer and looking at the stuff and said, man, I can think again. I went and told the vice president of engineering, he said, what is it there? But I said, I can think again. You know what he said? He said, that's good because you've got the audit coming back and they're getting, ready to, they're getting ready to check you again. Now, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to pass it. And the next audit came and it's the best audit we'd ever had, ever. So, again, there's those seasons that you go through. And when you're going through, you feel numb and you, 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 you maybe want, not even want to be around anymore. So, watch this. Here's what the Lord showed me. Look, when these seasons of loss comes, watch this. There's three parts to it. There's the hit, there's the hurt, and there's the healing. The hit, the hurt, the healing. 
Everybody in this church will go through all three of these stages at every crisis in your life. It can be through your marriage. It can be uh, through your work. It can be through your children. This morning on the way to church, uh, I wound up ministering to somebody who was going through something with their child they never thought they'd have to go through with and they're talking to me. And, and they said, tell me something. It wasn't from, it was from here either, but it was just somebody that passed through a long time ago. And they said, they said, talk to me. You know, talk to me. And, and, and again, you just never know what life is going to throw at you. You never know what you're going to be hit with. So watch this. Watch this now. How much you've invested in the hit determines how hard the process will be to heal the hurt. What am I talking about? Okay. There's people in here that might not have ever known Bethany. There's people in here that might not have ever known Sister Mary or Sister Kathleen. And so when they died, it hurt, but it may not have hurt so bad because they didn't have much of an investment in it. If I see somebody else with a hurt leg, I may feel kind of rough for them, but when it's my child that's got a hurt leg, now I've got more investment in this thing and it hurts me. I see somebody else crying in Walmart, it may get to me when I hear that cry, but when it's my child or my wife or one of y'all crying, it means something different because of the investment. So whatever the investment is, it, whatever the investment is that's been hit, that determines how hard it's going to be to work through the hurt. You've got to work. It's not, it's not a, it's a work. You've got to work it. That's why I've been thanking God uh, uh, for the last week of going up to the hospital every day. And, and although it hurt, I know that it was causing healing. And then yesterday, the Lord spoke to me in the last day or so about Bethany in such a way as I was actually ministering to somebody else who was hurting about Bethany. I was ministering to them and the Lord gave me peace about Bethany that he hasn't done yet until just a day or so ago. And it just changed something in me once God began to minister about Beth to me. So again, what you've invested, like in a marriage, you've invested, that hit hurts. Your children, you've invested, that hit hurts. You got memories, so your, your past is there. You're looking at your past, and, and whatever may happen in the past, it just keeps coming up forward. Especially if you've had a grieving cycle and you have not grieved successfully yet, it hurts. The present, and even like with Beth, you know, the big thing about Bethy is not only is that she's gone, but I, I was watching. I was sitting home, and Bethy was in. Bethy was in the hospital this last time. I actually gone home. I taken a bath, and I sat down for a minute to eat. And I was sitting down to eat, and I watched, how many have ever seen Last Man Standing? That's a funny show. And so we're watching Last Man Standing when his girl gets married, the, 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 the goofy girl. I can't even think of her name, the middle child. She's getting married, and as she's walking down the aisle, I just hold my head down, and I start crying. And I just kept trying to wipe my eyes, and, and of course I was, I was trying to keep the tears away so Linda wouldn't see it. And then Linda said, well, what's going on, buddy? What, what you crying about? And I said, it just hit me. I'll never get a chance to do that with Bethany. And she said, you don't know that. I said, yeah, I do. I'll never get a chance to do it with So not only is it past in the present, but the future can cause you to have a burden and cause you to go uh, in that grieving cycle. So remember, remember this. If somebody, you're, you're hurting, I, I was at the detention center and I was counseling with somebody. And the person I was counseling with, actually, uh, he had some very, he was psychotic. So he really, uh, he was beyond me actually, but we're sitting in there. He's psychotic. And uh, I took the notes and wrote it down. And, and he's acting real crazy. And, and I finally told him, I said, so, look, buddy, I, I'm here. I'm here for you. It means a lot to me to minister to somebody else's child because my daughter died just a few weeks ago. And he looked at me and laughed. David went to climb across that table and said, did you hear what I just said? And pop him one good hard time. But the God of me said, just sit down. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's psychotic. Leave him alone. So, okay. So when he actually got out of the room, I probably first went out there and said, so you want to go back to your cell, don't you? 
Whether they did or not, I guess he went back to his cell. <laughs> but again, he had nothing invested. And I have a lot invested in Bethany. So the same way with you. Think about your hurts. You go, well, I don't understand why somebody else is not hurting the way I'm hurting. Think about this. It's all got to do with the investment you have in it. What you have invested in the most is what's going to hurt you the most. Okay, so there's the hit, the hurt, and there's the healing. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, gonna drag this out because we're gonna, we're getting ready to, I'm getting ready to close. Believe it or not. How did David heal? What did David do to start the healing process? You see, David shows us. In this brief, just of ten verses, David shows us the hit, the hurt, and the healing. Of course, we know the hit was his child. And the hurt was, hey, I've got to do something. All I can do is pray and fast. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to see this child healed, but there's nothing else I can do. Some of you on here. There's things that have happened to you that you want to so bad to change. You want to so bad to do different. You want to so bad to make happen in a different way, but it didn't. And because it didn't, it wears on you. And you get to hear uh, in yourself, shoulda, coulda, woulda. How many's ever heard shoulda, coulda, woulda? I'm going to tell you what to do with shoulda, coulda, woulda. Let's see. What I want you to do, every last one of you, when you go home today, I want you to write on a piece of paper whatever it is that's bothering you shoulda, coulda, woulda and I want you to tear it up and give it to God because we say shoulda, coulda, woulda what? I didn't know I had no idea this was going to be last time in the hospital I had no idea that she was going to die. And so the week before she died, she, the cancer was getting her worse. And one day I remember I fussed with her. And I said, girl, you got to, she wouldn't do what we told her to do. She was told to wash her hands or whatever because it said she didn't get an infection. And she walked out there and washed her hands and did something else. And I said, did you tell her? She said, I'll take my medicine. So I put her medicine down there for her to take. Uh, and she didn't take it. And I said, and I remember I fussed with her. I said, girl, I will ride this thing to the ground with you. You can always depend on me and your mom being here. We'll be here. We're not going anywhere. We're here. I said, but I can't ride this thing to the ground with you on my back. You're going to have to help me some. And she cried a little bit. She said, okay, Dad. I had no idea that the cancer was affecting her brain, going to her brain, metastasized to her brain, and it gone all over her body. I had no idea how sick she was. And I've tried, I've kicked myself a hundred times over for for fussing at her because she was not doing her part. Not realizing. See, shoulda, coulda, woulda. I guarantee you, every last one of you in here, you got shoulda, coulda, wouldas. You need to take them and tear them up because you know what? If I had known, I wouldn't have done that. But I did not know. All I know is Bethany was on the verge of making the poke cuss. <laughs> you know, I've been thought about, I thought about the devil way up here. I will try to find the author and maybe start writing a book called God's Got This, The Life of Bethany Linton from the Cradle to Her Crown. And maybe on the backside put or her subtitle, Making the Poke Cuss. <laughs> <laughs> So again, all this stuff is real and it's there and you know you deal with it every day. The shoulda, coulda, woulda. So what, what, what did he do to deal with his grief after his loss? What did he do to help him stand out and what he did wind up lasting, lasting not only his lifetime but thousands of people have found relief. What did he do? There's three things he did. We're going to talk about these three things. One today, just part of, part of the first one today and next week we'll talk about the rest of them. If you know somebody's going through some grief or loss, they got the shoulda, coulda, woulda, the shoulda, coulda, woulda syndrome, bring them because we're going to find out that shoulda, coulda, woulda is Satan's way of keeping a leverage and a lever, a, a lever on you and a leverage against you so that you cannot heal. Okay? 
I did not know. I had to keep telling myself, I did not know. I did not know. So Satan quit throwing it in my face. I did not know I was being a dad. And being a dad, sometimes it's a day you say things that you don't necessarily like saying because you're trying to help your kid. Okay? So, so here we go. Number one. You ready? Number one. Y'all ready? And this thing will work. There you go. Watch this. Look at that. Have you ever felt like that? You're sitting there with your heart tore out of you. It's on the ground. It's got, it's got so many nails in it. You're hurting so bad. Watch this. Get ready. The first thing he did was he accepted. Listen carefully. This is the first thing. If you don't get this done, forget the rest of it. He accepted what he could not change. I remember that Sunday morning. I told y'all about it. I was preaching the best. He preached and he preached. And I preached on fear and didn't know. Just a few minutes later, the doctor's going to come in and say, that's it. There's nothing else we can do. Anything we do now is, is, is not going to prolong her life. It's probably going to shorten her life. You're just going to have to sit there. The main thing to do is just to go ahead and put her in palliative care. And I said, but I don't want to give up. And the doctor said, she looked at me and said, you're not giving up. And you're not stopping the battle. You're just changing the, the direction of the battle. You're giving it to God. Here's what they told me. You're giving it to God. And you're fighting for her comfort that she does not have right now. And so I said, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I remember having to tell her. But at, listen, when I finally accepted, this is something I cannot change. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you halted your own healing because you wanted, this is so bad, to have a different outcome that you could not accept, that there was something happening that you could not change. The Bible says in verse 22, And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live? Now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Again, here it is. Many times we get stuck in pain. We get stuck in the pool of the past. We get paralyzed by the present. All this stuff's going on in us. I told you a story many times about the lady, the lady that, that her son played ball with D.C. and her and her husband always sat with D.C.'s mom and I at the games and she was so full of life and bubbly and always hollering out at the kids. And I mean, this was just a great, great gal. But at Christmas... Her kid sister who had her permit was driving the car, ran a stoplight, stop sign, and when she did, it was like a three or four car accident. It killed her mother instantly. It maimed her and her two cousins in the back seat so they couldn't even come to the funeral. And it killed a man in another car and a baby in another car. And that lady refused comfort. We were there for another year or so. I never, literally, never saw her smile again. I never saw her holler at ball games like she did before. Didn't even see her at ball games. Her son was a good player. I didn't see her at ball games. When I did see her, she was always dragging. She had her head down. All that bubbly that she had was gone because she refused to be comforted. She would not accept. There's some things you cannot change. You got to give it to God. So when you get stuck in that pain, when you get stuck in that pull of the past, pulling you back, pulling you back, or you're paralyzed, you can't move into prison. Here's what happens: it, it, it robs you. It robs you. Here's what it robs. Watch this: it robs your peace and it robs your power. You don't have that peace. You don't have that power. That 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 young lady for the from time and I, I don't know about now because it's been so many years ago, but that young lady refused comfort. If I would even try to talk to her about God, she blamed God. She wouldn't talk to him about God. She wouldn't talk to him about her sister. She wouldn't talk to him about her mother. If she talked about anything, it was about the death of her mother. And that was it. That's it. And so life was at a standstill because she refused comfort and she refused to be healed. So then, it's amazing the freedom that we get in our own life when we learn how to 
accept things that we cannot change. Are you saying it cannot be changed at all? No, it just means that at my part, all I can do is give it to God. That's it. There's a lot of things I think about in my life that I've, I've accepted. But I can't change it. God's got to change it. If God don't change it, it ain't going to happen. But when God changes it, it's going to be changed. Amen? So, so again, accept there are things that you cannot change. Now, DC, get ready. I love this. Sometimes we just have to bow our head, say a prayer, and weather the storm. Y'all say that to me. Sometimes you just have to bow your head, say, say a prayer, and weather, weather the storm. Not realizing that all this stuff that's going on, God's going to use it one day for you to help somebody else. As the Bible says in Corinthians, we comfort others with the comfort we received when we went through our problems. Now we can comfort others because we've been there. I can't even tell you the people in the last, come on up here to see myself. I, won't, I can't even tell you the people in the last, since Bethany died, even while she was sick, the people that told me they were loving, they were kind, but they told me, we know how you feel. <laughs> and I didn't, but I wanted to say, oh, so your daughter died too. Oh, so you've had death in your family too. Oh, so you've had cancer in your family. No, I haven't had any of that, but I know how you feel. No, not really. I thank you for the thought, but not really. Or the people that said that heaven needed another angel. Bethany's not an angel. Bethany is, is being ministered to by angels. She was an angel here, a messenger of God, angel. She's not an angel in heaven. The angels are taking care of her, standing in attention, meeting her needs. When people do that, I just smile at them and say, thank you. Thank you. And I just keep on going. There's one lady, her son, she came here minister years, years, years ago on a Sunday night. Her son had uh, uh, multiple mu muscular dystrophy and had a rare form of muscular dystrophy. And he wasn't so good to be like a teenager. He wasn't living to be in his 20s. And I remember our family ministered with her family to her as he died. And, and went through the funeral process and, and then the grieving process. And even to this day, because she works at a nursing home, I see her from time to time. And, and, and her and Bethany got really close and they kept in contact. And, When I said that thing that Bethany had died, and she wrote back and said, I can really appreciate, maybe it's not the word I'm looking for, she said, I really can't, I understand the struggle that you're facing right now, but just like you told me, God's going to get you through it when I was going through. I'm telling you, he did, and God's going to get you through it now. I can take that and put it and read it every day. Number one, how did David get from his hit through his hurt to his healing? Accepted what he, number one, he accepted what he could not change. When you get to that point, God's going to do something special. Now I'm going to open the altar right there. Everybody stand. The altar's open. You can come here and pray at the altar. We pray at your seat. Y'all all experienced loss. 
every last one of you experienced loss in your life. You've experienced pain that nobody else knows what you're going through but you, and some of you are still going through that pain. And some, you say, matter of fact, just, just Saturday, I was ministering to somebody. Outside the church. As I ministered to this person, they had just suffered a loss themselves. As I'm walking out, I prayed with them. As I'm walking out, they said, Do me a favor. I said, What's that? And they said, Try not to think about Bethany. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I think about Bethany all the time. She's on my mind. And I said, Don't you think about the person you lost? And they said, It's hurts too bad to think about them. It's too fresh in my mind. And I said, if you don't think about them, you'll never heal. you got to accept them. you got to accept what you cannot change. This Christmas season, this season of life, period, take Christmas, it's just beginning, it's even Christmas this season of life to see a change these three things that we're going to talk about will bring a change in your life that will be amazing number one please carry it with you accept things that you cannot Change. Quit playing the shoulda, coulda, woulda game. Tear it up. Give it to God. That's Satan's ploy to keep you hung up in a grievance cycle. Do not listen to him. And I'm telling you, because I have to do it every day, when I'm reminded constantly about the stuff of Bethany, I just tear it up, throw it away, and I just think about the good times we had. Think about how strong she was. Think about her faith. And instead of planning a memorial, in stone, that's why we're planning memorials in life, and that is the relay for life that she wanted to do, and the sponsoring of Mayas Pilgrims, what she wanted to do. All the stuff to live on and keep on going and keep on going and cause people to live and cause all kinds of good stuff. And maybe even that book, uh, uh, God's Got This, it'll keep her memory alive in a good way, not a bad way, and bring healing to a lot of people. talking about this Tuesday night, but just remember it again. For our dismissal prayer today, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer. Together. Everybody's here Tuesday night. I see them smiling. Ready? And make sure you do it right, because I did it one time when I was in the child's class teaching them to do the Lord's Prayer, and she said, Lord, clean my trash basket. As I try not to clean other people's trash baskets. <laughs> Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Father, I thank you for this day. God, help us, Lord, to look to you and to know that there's always healing available if we will accept your comfort. Lord, we trust you totally right now. And we know, God, that you got this. And we trust you, God. And we also know that either way, 